April 16, 1945. The population of Berlin wakes up in an uproar after hearing the thunderous Soviet artillery in the distance. Despite the fact that the Soviets were some 60 kilometers from Berlin, no alarm had been raised or news of the Soviet attack in the order officially announced. However, and despite not having any official announcement, the Berliners knew very well that the great Soviet offensive towards their city had begun. During these first days, and due to the lack of truthful information from the government, rumors and hoaxes of all kinds spread throughout the capital. Some said that the Soviets were already 15 kilometers from Berlin, and others announced that the enemy had already reached the neighborhoods in the eastern part of the city. The truth was that nobody knew what was really happening, but everything pointed to the fact that the city's days were numbered. Now, the question that most of them asked themselves is, what would the end be like, and if they would survive it? Little by little, graffiti appeared on the walls that read, Berlin will remain German. Others said, victory or slavery, and in some graffiti it could also be read, whoever believes in Hitler, believes in victory. Faced with such a situation, and waiting for official news, people tried to hide their anguish and continued to lead a normal life. Berliners kept going to shops of all kinds, knowing that their money would soon be worth nothing. On the other hand, they also tried to collect as much food as possible before the fighting reached the capital. With regard to leisure, there was not much to do, since the vast majority of bars, theaters, or cinemas were closed. But the few cinemas that are open, like the one in Charlottenburg, were very crowded. In the end, the only thing that many wanted was to escape from reality. One of the films that was broadcast the most was Kohlberg's, which despite having premiered on January 30, 1945, was broadcast again in all the cinemas that were still open during this month of April. The reason, as is evident, is that the film narrates the heroic defense of the city of Kohlberg during the Napoleonic Wars. It mattered little that in the real story, the city had ended up surrendering to the French, because in the German version of 1945, the Prussian city of Kohlberg stood firm in its resistance and forced the French to withdraw. That was the idea that they wanted to convey to the German people. The firm conviction that if they managed to organize a fierce resistance, causing many casualties to their enemies, they would have no choice but to stop attacking and withdraw. According to testimonies of the time, this film motivated many soldiers, and even civilians, who were very moved when they saw it and were eager to become those heroes they were watching. This can also be seen today because, after all, many films of this type are still being made, called recruitment films, which serve to motivate young people to enter the army. Another issue that requires attention is the operation of the companies and industrial plants that were located in Berlin, or near the capital. As strange as it may seem, and despite the fact that the city had been heavily crushed by Allied bombing for many months, the vast majority of factories continued to operate at full capacity. With the loss of the Ruhr Basin, and of Silesia, these were one of the last factories left to the Germans. Due to the urgency of the situation, and the lack of material and ammunition of all kinds at the front, everything produced by these factories was immediately sent to the combat front, as soon as it was finished. Whether it was bullets, rifles, machine guns, grenades, or some new tank, everything was sent to the last German positions along the Oder at full speed. The situation was so difficult that, due to the lack of soldiers, many companies had to send their own workers as drivers, so that the material could reach the combat zone. However, many civilians refused to go, as in many cases this would mean death for them. With respect to other services, except for industry, such as radio programs, weather services, or mail services, they also continued to function practically normally, until a few days later the battle within the city began. A question that many can ask is whether, faced with the great threat that hung over the capital, many Berliners decided to leave it, or if, on the contrary, they decided to stay. We have to point out that by April 1945, many Berliners had left the city, in order to avoid the bombing, as had happened in most big cities. However, it is estimated that the population at the beginning of the year was still over 3 million people. To give an example, Albert Speer offered help to flee the city, to many musicians of the Berlin Philharmonic. But, despite what common sense might lead you to believe, the truth is that the vast majority of them, whose last concert took place on April 12, chose to stay in the capital. 
the vote that they carried out among themselves, to decide whether to choose the safe transport offered by Albert Speer to leave Berlin, was rejected. In the end, they all had many relatives in the capital, and strong sentimental ties, so they decided to stay. Only one musician named Tashner chose to use Speer's transportation to leave with his wife and children, to a place that would soon be occupied by the Americans. Finally, we come to the subject of the self-styled Berlin Fortress. As we shall see in future programs, Berlin's defenses had begun to prepare at a very late stage, and although efforts intensified during the month of April, they were far from minimally effective in stopping the Red Army. Major roads and highways were still open. There were few cannons and armored vehicles in the defensive complex, and the only men for the defense of the city who were seen armed were the old members of the Berlin police, members of the Volksdrum, and teenagers and children of the Hitler Youth. The almost total absence of real soldiers meant that the fight would not last long. A whole series of crude defenses began to rise in the capital. All official buildings were protected with sandbags. The rubble of what had been large blocks of flats a few months ago was now being piled up to try to cut off all kinds of streets. The same thing happened with trams and vehicles that had been out of service and that were now filled with rubble and placed in the streets as barricades. These were the defenses that were to stop the Soviet attack on Berlin, but, many wondered, if, as the war propaganda said, these barricades would be enough. A joke was spread among the population that went as follows. The Russians will take about 2 hours and 15 minutes to break through these fortifications. They will spend 15 minutes crossing them, and 2 hours laughing at them. And so, it was like little by little everything got worse as the German defenses along the Oder were giving way, and the news that the Soviets were closer to the capital began to arrive. Finally, when the Soviets arrived in Berlin on April 20 and 21, the vast majority of these male civilians were mobilized for the armed defense of the capital. Well, so far this program, in which we have seen what the last days were like in the German capital before the start of the battle. In future programs, we will see in detail how all the defensive rings surrounding Berlin were prepared, and how effective they were when the Soviets got to them. I leave you in the description two live programs in which we have extensively analyzed this battle, which I am sure will be of interest to you. We end this video here. Many thanks to everyone, especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and see you in the next one. See you soon.